A cunning wife steals an illicit fortune from her husband, leading to a difficult journey of hiding, adopting a new identity, and outsmarting the mercenary sent by her vengeful spouse. Bridget, a telemarketing manager in New York City, pressures her employees to make their sales. Meanwhile, her husband, Clay, meets with two dealers to sell them pharmaceutical medicines illegally. The situation becomes tense as the buyers brandish guns and refuses to release the money. As Clay wallows in self-pity, thinking he's about to be shot, they dump the $700,000 cash on the ground. Shaken, the man heads home with his clothes stuffed with cash. Later, Bridget anxiously waits for her husband to return home, and when Clay finally arrives, she immediately questions him about the transaction. He shows her the money, but she insults him for the risky way he brought it home. Still on edge, Clay lashes out and hits her. He quickly apologizes, but she remains understandably upset. However, the wads of cash eventually brighten up her mood. Clay admires his wife's cunning intellect and refers to her as a criminal mastermind. As Bridget puts the money away. Clay is eager to repay the loan shark they borrowed $100,000 from. He also tries to initiate a more intimate celebration, but Bridget nudges him to shower first. While Clay shouts dinner suggestions, his wife writes him a note, puts on her coat, and quietly exits the apartment. When the doctor emerges from the shower, he finds the mirror image note. He then checks the money bag but finds it filled with toilet paper instead. Furious, he glances out the window and witnesses his wife running away with the $700,000. In her getaway vehicle, Bridget discards her wedding ring and heads to Chicago. Bridget arrives in Beston, a small town 12 hours away from Chicago, and decides to make a stop at a local bar. Inside, Shep and Chris are drinking to celebrate the return of their friend, Mike, and his failed attempt at leaving the town. While Chris is preoccupied with finding someone to spend the night with, Shep notices his friend's wedding ring, but Mike avoids the topic. Just as Chris leaves the bar, Bridget enters. Intrigued by her city vibe, Mike tries to flirt with Bridget, still holding on to his dreams of the big city. Initially, she rejects his advances, but after an intimate examination, Mike meets her size criteria and they go home together. The next morning, Mike awakens to find Bridget on the phone. He gives her privacy while she's talking to Frank Griffith, her lawyer. The New Yorker presents a hypothetical situation involving a wife who stole $700,000 from her husband, which was earned from an illicit deal. Frank advises Bridget to keep the money and cash until their divorce is finalized, so her husband can't make a legal claim to it. Bridget instructs her lawyer to proceed with the divorce, and he tells her to stay here hidden until it's finalized. Following her lawyer's advice, Bridget opts to stay in Benton for the time being. She unceremoniously leaves Mike and starts searching for a job. Thanks to her impressive qualifications, she secures a position at an insurance company, where she showcases her talent for mirror writing during the contract signing. To evade Clay, Bridget adopts a new identity, Wendy Croy, a reversal of New York, reasoning to her boss that she's running away from her dangerous husband. In the hallway, Bridget runs into Mike and they're both taken aback that they're now colleagues. She pushes him into a nearby bathroom and asserts that she wouldn't have entertained him if she intended to stay in Benton. With the job secured, Bridget settles into a motel until she finds something more permanent. The following day, Bridget calls Frank to update him on her situation. The lawyer complains about Clay's persistent calls, mentioning the loan shark's demands. He instructs her to calm him, but warns her about the call being traced. Bridget reassures Frank that her husband isn't that smart. Hesitantly, she calls her husband via an operator service. The freshly injured Clay answers the call, but when he realizes it's an operator, he slyly attempts to determine the caller's location. Sensing danger, Bridget hangs up. After work, Bridget visits the bar and, coincidentally, Mike is there. Before long, they retreat to a private area for a physical encounter. The New Yorker clarifies that their relationship is purely physical, but Mike desires something more. Their relationship continues as Bridget intends, though one night, the local repeats his desire to have a deeper connection with her. As she gathers her clothes, Mike suggests going to her place, but she states that it's off limits. Undeterred, Mike insists on getting to know her better, but Bridget emphasizes the importance of her privacy. Despite his clinginess, she sets another bedtime rendezvous before leaving. The following day, Bridget becomes desperate as she finds the small town boring. With that, she calls her husband again, quickly hanging up after instructing him to find the nearest phone booth and provide her with the number. However, Clay is prepared as he's hired Harlan, a private detective, to help catch her. The doctor jogs around the room as if he ran to the phone booth and back, giving her the number to the phone that the detective has prepared. When Bridget calls the number, Clay reveals that their borrowed money has now increased to $150,000, and he's hired a detective who will receive a 50% bounty on any recovered money. Bridget offers to pay off the loan and the detective's fee if Clay agrees to a divorce. Unsurprisingly, her husband refuses. The detective signals him to prolong the conversation, but Bridget swiftly disconnects it when the house phone rings, indicating that Clay isn't at a phone booth. The detective reports that they were only able to trace her area 
code. Rattled, Bridget immediately contacts Frank, who reassures her that an area code alone isn't enough to track her down. He advises her to find company if she feels unsafe alone. Heeding his advice, Bridget spends the night with Mike, then begins searching for a house to rent. The following morning, Bridget maintains her distance, but Mike persists in pursuing her. Frustrated, she creates a scene as soon as they enter the workplace, accusing him of inappropriate behavior. After work, Bridget moves into her new residence and hides the money in the attic. Meanwhile, Clay resorts to illegal prescriptions in New York to raise funds for the loan shark. Harlan then confirms what Frank advised, stating that an area code is insufficient to locate Bridget. After noticing the reflection of their New York poster, Clay deduces that Bridget is using the alias Wendy Croy. He instructs Harlan to search for this name, stating that his wife's desire to return to New York will reflect in her chosen alias. In Beston, Bridget visits the bar looking for Mike and apologizes for making him seem like a creep. As a peace offering, she invites him to her new house. However, Mike declines, maintaining he wants to know more than just her body. Uncharacteristically, Bridget decides to be honest, but he finds her story too far-fetched and accuses her of lying. In an attempt to bridge the gap between them, Mike opens up about himself, sharing that he works as a claims adjuster. He explains that his job involves hearing intimate details of people's problems. As Mike shares his insights on profiling people through credit reports, Bridget's imagination sparks. She comes up with a plan to identify cheating husbands through their credit reports then offer their wives an insurance payout by eliminating these unfaithful partners. They head to the office and use their database to identify potential cheaters. Bridget turns it into a game, making calls to pitch their unique murder service. Initially hesitant, Mike gives in when Bridget promises to take him to her place. After more intimacy at Bridget's place, she asks about Mike's wife. He's ashamed to discuss Trish, revealing that it occurred while he was in Buffalo. He confides that, until recently, he'd been desperate to escape his small town and ended up making a big mistake. Bridget follows him to the shower, wanting him to elaborate on what recently changed his mind. There, he confesses his feelings and frustrations about the relationship. The next day, Bridget arrives at the office but discovers that a man was looking for her. Unnerved, she contacts Frank, but he's unavailable. That night, Bridget confides in Mike about someone searching for her. Her lover finds it hard to believe, questioning why anyone would want to pursue her. Instead of answering, Bridget shares that she secured their first client for their side business, Lance Collier. She describes Lance as a retired consultant in Miami who, who beat his wife while lavishly spending on young waitresses. As the femme fatale tries to convince Mike, he walks out on her to play hockey, unwilling to be part of her diabolical plan. She chases after him, but Mike marches off. When Bridget decides to go home, she's followed into her car by Harlan, with a gun already pointed at her. During their drive to retrieve the money, Bridget attempts to charm Harlan into betraying Clay. When that doesn't work, she tricks the detective into showing her if the stereotype about men like him is true. The moment Harlan unbuckles the seatbelt to prove it, Bridget crashes the car into a pole, launching her captor out. The day after the crash, a detective interviews Bridget in the hospital. She takes advantage of racial prejudice to minimize the investigation, claiming the bounty hunter got violent while trying to force her into contacting her husband. When the officer leaves, Mike enters and offers his apologies for doubting her. The femme fatale seizes this opportunity to play on his sympathy. Using manipulative tactics, Bridget again tries to convince Mike Mike to join her in eliminating Lance Collier, citing that it will secure their future together. Still, Mike's morals prevent him from entertaining her diabolical plan. Bridget declares that she can't stay in Beston forever, so she gathers her clothes and leaves. Mike drives her home, where Bridget immediately calls her husband. The doctor informs her of Harlan's replacement, a local named Bert, who's already outside her house. Clay threatens that now that he knows her whereabouts, he's willing to spend all the money on criminals eager to torment her. Bridget offers to send him $15,000 to buy herself a week, claiming she needs time to wrap up her affairs in Beston. She promises to deliver the remaining money to him in New York afterward. Clay agrees, but reminds her that he'll send cutthroats her way once the week ends. On another occasion at the office, Mike overhears Bridget booking a plane ticket. She claims that she's going to New York for the weekend. One morning, Bridget prepares a DIY spike strip and cookies. As she offers the cookies to Bert, she discreetly places the spike strip under his tires. After a while, the femme fatale gets into a taxi and departs. When Bart attempts to follow, his tires get punctured. The taxi takes her to Buffalo's municipal office, where she bribes a worker to give her Mike's marriage records. She also takes a calling card and the county clipboard. Using the marriage records, Bridget tracks down Trish, Mike's wife, masquerading as someone from the county office. As she returns home, Bridget takes a moment to process that Trish used to be a man. She soon arrives home with a couple of new bags, waving to Bert as she exits the cab. That night at the bar, Chris shares that Bridget 
wanted to know a secret that Mike is ashamed of, though he claims not to have told her any. His friend then jokes that Bridget offered him something physical, which infuriates Mike. After a brief altercation, Mike storms out of the bar. Later, Mike leaves a drunk voicemail for the city woman, expressing his feelings and referencing his mistakes with Trish. Unbeknownst to Mike, Bridget is at home, listening to him talk. She learns that he's willing to do anything to be with her. After he hangs up, she scribbles on her notepad, processing her thoughts. Mike regrets leaving the voicemail and rushes to Bridget's house, thinking that she's in New York for the weekend. As he deletes the message, he notices the note that Bridget just scribbled. Interpreting it as a sign that she reciprocates his feelings, he keeps it as a memento, not knowing that the woman is just hiding under her bed. After the weekend, Mike eagerly visits her, filled with the belief that Bridget loves him back. However, his happiness quickly fades when he discovers a plane ticket from Miami. Alarmed, he confronts her, questioning if she went there to kill Lance Collier. The femme fatale asserts that she did it for the sake of the relationship and expects him, her lover, to understand. She proudly displays the money given by Mrs. Collier, evidence that Lance deserved it. In response, Mike reveals the note he took from her table, confessing that he thought she loved him. Outraged by his invasion of privacy, Bridget accuses him of lacking the commitment to leave Beston and kicks him out. As Bridget slams the door, a silent laugh escapes her, proving that it was all an act. Lance Collier is alive, and the money she showed was the money she'd taken from Clay. The following day, Mike visits Bridget in her office, trying to navigate his emotions about being involved with the murderer. However, Bridget pushes him away, declaring that she now has the money to return to New York. When Mike offers to accompany her, she tells him to find his own way out of Beston. Determined to prove his commitment, Mike declares that he's willing to do whatever it takes. In response, Bridget tasks him with eliminating a New Yorker named Cahill, who scams people out of their properties. She states that after Cahill, they'd be in a committed relationship, bound together by murder. However, Mike realizes he's unwilling to kill just to be with her and leaves. Undeterred, the femme fatale concocts a new plan to manipulate Mike. She forges a letter from Trish, stating that they'll soon be working together in the same company. When Mike receives the letter, he panics, fearing the revelation of his marriage to a man. Desperate, he rushes to Bridget's house and declares that he is willing to eliminate Cahill as long as they never return to Beston again. On the day of Mike's New York trip, Bridget falsely accuses Bert of inappropriate behavior, preventing him from following them. As they go over their plan, Bridget emphasizes the psychological importance of turning off the lights once Mike has eliminated Cahill. In New York, Mike takes a cab to the apartment building and waits nearby until the lights in Cahill's room go off. He then verifies the target's room number on the building directory and uses the keys provided by Bridget. Once inside, Mike wakes up Cahill, who's actually Clay, introducing himself as a burglar. Everything goes as planned, but he's unable to deliver the finishing blow. Frustrated, the country boy exclaims Bridget's alias. Upon hearing the name, Clay realizes his wife's involvement and directs Mike's attention to their wedding photo. Mike removes the gag and Clay reveals the entire situation, clarifying that Bridget wants him dead because she can't acquire any assets with the stolen money while they are still married. As the conversation unfolds, Clay realizes that Mike isn't a hired assassin, but her lover. He also deduces that Bridget plans to frame her boyfriend for her husband's death. They both come to the conclusion that Bridget is waiting for the apartment lights to turn off as her signal that Clay is dead. They're proven correct when, shortly after the lights go out, Bridget enters the dark apartment. However, she doesn't expect Clay and Mike to work together against her. Her husband proceeds to explain the remainder of her plan, revealing that Bridget intended to discover his body when she returned home to reconcile and then blame it on Mike, her jealous boyfriend. As Clay talks, the femme fatale unexpectedly kisses him, just enough to open his mouth and flood it with mace. Finishing her husband off herself, Mike rushes to the man's aid while Bridget calmly wipes her fingerprints off the canister. She then claims that she did it all for Mike. Bridget then attempts to entice the country boy into a forced roleplay scenario. However, Mike rebuffs her advances and goes to the phone to report her. She then resorts to hurling slurs at Mike, revealing her knowledge of Trisha's real identity to provoke a reaction. Mike lashes out, succumbing to Bridget's desired roleplay. Unbeknownst to him, she discreetly dials the emergency services, who can hear their conversation in real time. This allows the operator to hear and record his confession to Clay's murder and Bridget's cries as the man forces himself on her, believing it to be part of their roleplaying. Eventually, Mike is incarcerated. He tries to blame Bridget for Lance Collier's murder, but his lawyer informs him that Lance is alive. The lawyer then reports the overwhelming evidence against him, from the taped confession to the gun and knife in his possession that night. Mike suggests one possible piece of evidence, the Cahill label on the directory, which Bridget replaced to trick him. Unbeknownst to him, Bridget is burning that final piece of evidence as they speak. In the end, the cunning femme fatale manages to evade justice, proving that she is indeed a criminal mastermind. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.